On the right, we have Ferdinando Regalia, who's the Chief of Social Protection and Health at the Inter-American Development Bank. In the middle, former cgd -er and now freelance public policy consultant, David Rudman. And on the left, Bill Savadoff, who's a senior fellow here at CGD. Each inquisitor will ask one or more panelists to respond to a question or challenge to the arguments we've heard for benchmarking aid interventions against cash transfers. So we'll have them ask their questions first, then we'll turn it back to the pros to answer briefly and succinctly, and we'll go on from there with another round afterwards. So go ahead, inquisitors. We, who would like to go first? You may choose. I'll go first. Um, uh, when, when, we, when Amanda asked me to be an inquisitor, we were actually talking about this kind of like a Supreme Court. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to be Ruth Bader Ginsburg <laughs> here. But now I'm feeling like I ought to just recognize that I'm a Clarence Thomas and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the, the next thought I had was when, uh, so trying to figure out what to say, I'm, I'm at the, the, the um, coffee break and I'm thinking, well, Maybe the Center for Global Development should have just handed everybody a, a $3 cash and we could all go out to, to figure out whichever coffee station we wanted to go to outside and I, I we'd reconvene. Cows, <laughs> <laughs> we'd reconvene in about half an hour once everybody had finally figured out where their coffees were and come back. So um, that's kind of a lead into what I'm, what I'm thinking, which is the uh, collective action story, benchmarking what is most of uh, I think the, the core of, of development is around collective issues, collective um, things of, of social um, aggregate and macro uh, importance. And um, to introduce that with a, a small story, um, Nancy Birdsell and I were in Tanzania a couple of years ago um, talking to the central bank president about um, trying to uh, take their, their expected bonanza in natural gas funds and put some portion of that into cash transfers, oil to cash, uh, some stuff Todd Moss has been working on here. And um, the response um, that I didn't have a good answer to from the central bank president, um, and now I will pose to you, is um, that this is an exhaustible resource that needs to be invested. We need a, a, a return for the Tanzanians. We can't disperse this in, in, in current consumption. It has to be something that's going to uh, be invested in a way that the future generations are going to benefit from. And um, we can't give it to the, the uh, we, we are not going to transfer it to people because what people really need are collective goods. The, the government doesn't have enough money to invest in the roads, the electric infrastructure, the sanitation, the ports, um, that uh, the regulation of, of land use and all these different things that are so important to, uh, a, developed, to, to, a, to a developed and functioning economy. So my, uh, so my first, um, oh sorry, and, and the last part, the other small story is John Briscoe was talking about how he had been in India uh, many, many decades ago. Uh, there was a program to build a barrier to protect families' properties from flooding and um, he was, uh, thought that was a bad idea. This is just gonna be a construction public works thing and make somebody rich and it's not really gonna help the poor. Uh, give, it should be a program that's going to be dealing with their social and, and economic needs. Um, and yet he went back 20 years later and people were telling him that was the thing that made a difference. It protected their land in a way that they could invest uh, and make a difference. So I just pose it to, not to a particular person, but to, to the panel um, that uh, cash uh, may be a, a, a great benchmark in, in, in some small uh, number of kinds of programs. But for the core of what it means for a country to develop and grow, uh, it's a bad benchmark because it doesn't deal with this collective good issue. Hey, good point, David. Okay, I've never been an in, is this on? Never been an inquisitor before. Um, I, I think of the, the, that uh, passage from the Laurel and Hardy movie. Uh, it's called the Murder Case, in which this indignant detective asks Stan Laurel, "Where were you on the night of November fifteenth?" The day before Christmas? No, the day after Christmas. He says, uh, September, October, no wonder. Um, that, that's the passage, but it's, it's famous. So where were you on the night of November 15th? Right? Um, this is actually a very hard job for us because this is both, I think, a great idea and very reasonably presented. 
And I, what I think I may do is caricature you in order to attack you. That will make my job easier and hopefully make this more entertaining, which is part of the purpose. Yeah, so I'm gonna call you guys a bad word and if this is gonna go on the web, I hope you bleep it out. Um, you guys are neoliberals. Um, you wanna monetize everything. You know, imagine if governments stopped funding education, stopped building roads, stopped uh, financing health insurance and just gave people money. Here, you go buy your health insurance. Here, you build the roads. You, this is not, this is beyond charter schools. This is like, you go fund your own education. Um, what people would have to do is come together in groups and create substitute governments, right, to build the roads and do everything else. So government would be abdicating its responsibility if all it did was give away money, right? Uh, even though that might make Rose and uh, Milton Friedman happy, they're the ones who, who propose the negative income tax. So clearly there are limits to this idea. And given that it's already being done actually on a very large scale, we're here a billion people are receiving some kind of money, I think it's worth talking about what are the limits. It isn't just this little insurgent movement, if it ever was. Uh, when should we be giving poor people cash like we do in the United States with welfare? And when is it better to be funding other public goods? Uh, what are the limits to this idea? Okay, great, what are the limits, Ferdinando? So um, I start from one of the uh, figures that uh, uh, Paul showed in his presentation. And he mentioned as a, as a measure of success, the fact that in Mexico you see some uh, income, uh, um, long-term imp imp uh, impact on uh, uh, income generation capacity of the families. Actually, that evaluation is restricted to a very small group of uh, families were very close to the uh, welfare um, cutoff. So actually you don't observe much dynamics on uh, long-term impacts of transfer on, uh, on income generation capacity. And that has also led in the last two, three years to a little bit of crisis of the arguments in favor of cash in Latin America. Even in countries have implemented large cash transfer program, like in Mexico, in Ecuador, uh, in Peru. They are looking for the productive response. So the, the argument, we are back to the argument of give them a rod and teach them to fish. Um, so the, the real question is how do we answer in a compelling way that beyond the uh, academic arguments with strong evidence, which uh, seems not to have been convinced countries have implemented this large ca scale cash transfers program for many years covering uh, millions, uh, millions of people. Okay, back at you. I'm who wants to answer first? <laughs> Correct. You may answer what you like. You can also invent questions that you want to answer. Are you a neoliberal? Um, Are there really limits to cash? Um, there might be, but let's find out. I think that's what we're trying to say here, right? Um, and so that's the whole point. There's also the other kind of related issue that I don't think we've touched on yet today, which is related to the limits of cash, which has to do with implementation capacity. So yes, there, there are these collective action kind of problems that need to be solved. and. Um, so yes, we theoretically understand that the state or some other actor should come in and solve those. Can, is the state capable of doing that, right? And so that I think is a very big part of this whole problem that we're facing with aid, right, and development, which is just the implementation of even things that what we believe, even we on this side, the haters believe the state should actually do, but the state can't do it. And so what we're saying is, given that the state can't do it and the money is going to be wasted, why don't we benchmark those actions against cash? And maybe it could be that if you just gave cash, given all the implementation failures and all the corruption and all the leakage, right, that in the end, the best thing to do is just give the cash, right? So building those barriers to protect, well, okay, so in that case it worked, but in many, many, many cases it doesn't work because of, you know, we understand why. Corruption, lack of coordination, uh, vested interests, elite capture. This way, we empower individuals. 
Okay, and yes, there's some market failures there. There's some issues of people organizing, but maybe we should trust people as well. We know in other circumstances, villages and communities do work together. There is social capital, right? Um, and so on balance, let's see what happens. I think we're saying that uh, cash is very powerful, that yes, there are, it, theoretically there are limitations, but on the practical side, cash may ultimately be the best thing. Where, where did you get these guys from? <laughs> this is the first time I've been in a debate where the three inquisitors support our points. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, but let me take them one by one. I mean, I think the natural instinct is to say, oh, what about market failures and public goods, right? Uh, and I increasingly think that that argument is really the refuge of scoundrels. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and let me tell you why it's the refuge of scoundrels, right? The, the first one is a pure theory argument. How do you know there's a market failure? How do we do this empirically? We show there's a market failure when we can show there's an improvement in something without increasing resources. There cannot be a market failure if you have to show that it only an increase in resources increases something. So if it is a market failure solving, you don't need resources. You need the market. You need the government to do something which brings back the money. Right? So you wouldn't need donors, you wouldn't need nonprofits. All you would need is a system that allows that collective action to happen. It generates more resources which you can take back. Right? So, you, so the, the proof of a market failure is I improve things without, without putting in resources. So it's off the table. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's just off the table. Right? I mean, if you were really trying to solve a market failure, you don't need more resources. I mean, that's the fundamental point of a market failure. Right? The second reason it's the refuge of scoundrels is the following. My, my colleagues Tuti Khemani and Phil Kiefer have done this really nice work, right, where they show, you know, if you look at survey after survey of what people want from the governments, they want them to solve public goods, right? There's a genius of the political system in, in our countries. Right. And by R, I mean the, the, the brown population, right? Uh, uh, and, and the African population, uh, which is the following. It takes articulated demands for public goods and solutions of market failures in the political system very smartly converts that into the provision of pure private goods, right? So if you look at India, for example, and you look at what is it that people demand from the government, it's what we would think about as public goods, right? I mean, it's, it's big infrastructure, it's electricity, it's all that kind of stuff. What does the government give? There's this really nice paper which shows, if you look at federal schemes in India, there are 27 different federal schemes, each of which is a pure private transfer, right? It's food, it's something else, it's you know, different kinds of pieces of goods that are given in a way that completely uh, moves away from trying to provide the public goods that were supposed to be provided. So I want to see, the, and I think there's a logic to that system and a beautiful theory and holding together of that system that the cash will break, right? Uh, the reason, and the, the, the second part that I'm very confused about is we are not talking about governments. We are talking about donors and nonprofits. Right? And there's a problem with donors and nonprofits, which is the following. I keep trying to Google this, but I can't get right it. No, we can't get it. We have there, a was a, there was a car that was made in uh, 1960 in, the, in one of the Eastern, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Asian Skoda governments. The, the Skoda yeah. was one of the better ones. It was something else, even worse, right? The reason it survived and survived is because the government gets subsidizing it, right? And we know that the game of everybody in town, the basic game is we have a bad product and we want to keep it going by subsidizing it. So the bankers do this with their mortgage stuff, you know, and they get the government to subsidize. Global health specialists say that there is no demand for it, therefore need, need to, you know, subsidize demand for it. And this is what donors and nonprofits do, which is they have a bad product and they want to keep getting money to distribute that bad product through subsidies. And I think the cash removes that essential uh, bad discipline and bad accounting in this entire system, right? So when we come to donors and nonprofits, which is what we are going to talk about here, and not what government should be doing with the government's own money, right? Which is, in a democracy, they should decide what they want to do with their own money. 
Uh, I think we are in a fundamentally different world where the lack of accounting that Paul is talking about is strategic, right, and reflects a particular system, a global system of governance that's been set up. And I think we need to talk, you know, seriously about how that relationship that we are talking about is fundamentally different. Okay, so I'm going to move away from theory a little bit and just focus a little bit on this idea of being a neoliberal <laughs> and also collective action. And so the one thing that I want to comment on in terms of being a neoliberal is that, you know, David had mentioned the fact that, you know, we should all move away. I'll give you all cash. You can find your own way of insuring yourself. And I would make the argument, and you can maybe criticize me for making this argument, but this is what's being done in many developing countries anyway. And this is what Asha had talked about, that you don't have access to formal financial services. So you're kind of finding members of your own social network that are living within the village or someplace else, and you're finding a way to save and insure yourself. In many cases, these informal financial mechanisms are extremely efficient because I know who is risky and who isn't risky. I know whether or not you're going to pay me back. I know whether or not you actually really need that money. Obviously, there are certain limitations to that. But the, I would just be a little bit careful by saying what we've seen when these formal financial services actually come in, which I realize are not going to be a public good in many cases, they're not necessarily kind of providing better financial services that the poor actually need. Uh, they're often located in kind of urban areas. They're extremely expensive. They're providing accounts that aren't necessarily what they need or they want. And so, you know, we've seen that these informal systems have arisen. They seem to be working quite well. But we don't want to move all the way from informal services to kind of formal financial services. If they're doing this with their own money right now, maybe if given kind of an additional injection of cash, they could even make things more efficient and do it better as compared with having it being offered by someone else. I'm going to hold off on the collection act, collective action comment for right now and just let it go back to you guys. Okay. Paul, would you like to add your two cents to any of these comments? Sure, I'll, I'll say uh, a word or two, but I have such articulate and intelligent uh, panelists here on my team that <laughs> what, what a value can I add over and above? <laughs> Um, I think the two things I'd say quickly. First is that, you know, I think we all are with you guys in hoping to move towards a world where sort of public money is spent on public goods and that, oh. is it, can we make it, yeah, yeah better? Um, there is an enormous gap between agreeing in principle that roads can be public goods and showing empirically that a given road that costs a given amount and runs from a given location to another point B um, is in fact a public good and is going to generate returns greater than the costs of building it. Um, and I would like to see cash transfers used as a lever to force people to make that case more convincingly. Um, and I think that, that you guys would also be happy with that outcome. The second, I just wanted to speak briefly to your point about the evidence and say that um, I think one thing that folks should know about in, in terms of interpreting the evidence on cash transfers is the recent shift from studies on streams of long-term smaller payments, which have been the predominant mode of delivery in Latin America, to studies that look at the impacts of one-time large grants um, to households and then back off. Um, and intuitively, these things are very different in the sense that when given the promise of a stream of small payments while your child is in school, um, you should uh, sort of rationally start planning around that right? and, and planning to uh, you know, increase consumption by a little bit each year. Whereas given a one-time lump sum payment, you're faced with the quandary of you know, what can I do to actually turn this one-time thing into something that will have meaningful long-term impacts. And so my read of the evidence is very much that where you see the more significant investments, whether it's in income generating activities or in other things like early childhood nutrition or durables, it tends to be where you've given folks that one-time large transfer. So I don't know how consistent that is with the experiences you described, but that is my read of the data. OK, inquisitors. You can also reflect on whether you think these arguments are adequate and then add additional points. Silence from that part. <coughs> They're thinking. Oh, deep thinking. <laughs> deep thinking. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm to lull you into complacency. <laughs> we slammed your mouth no, anyway. <laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, pitch a different uh, concern, which is the dynamics that get unleashed by, by these transfers. So uh, in the uh, several people, pieces you've mentioned, you sort of lightly address the labor supply issue. But if you're going to be transferring cash to people, um, there's some literature on, on the impact of this in terms of people uh, having labor supply uh, reductions. Um, and 
that concerns me less than the kind of dynamics in two different levels. One, when I saw the Mpeza uh, phone being held up, I was just thinking about the range of ways in which uh, people game systems. Um, if there's a large amount of money flowing into Kenya through uh, Give Directly or some other thing like that, um, do people start using their entrepreneurial skills to figure out how to attract this external flow of money that's coming in um, rather than the harder entrepreneurship that they need to do within their own domestic economy? Um, uh, kind of bizarre uh, uh, Dutch disease at the micro level. Um, and then the larger dynamics when it starts getting up to scale. So um, found out that uh, Jilma Rousseff at, at, in Brazil has just raised the Bolsa Familia transfer program amounts. I just found out thanks to Amanda Glassman, an economist. But uh, uh, I wasn't reading it this morning. She was, so you get credit. Um, and uh, this is exactly the kind of thing where uh, for countries that have um, middle or middle income status or low income status, these kind of large transfers, if they start entering the political system that way, um, and this is true whether it's the, the political system or in the case of low income countries, large donor flows coming in uh, in this way. So it's the, the distortions that it starts generating, either the, the simple story was the labor supply story, the more complex story is the gaming through Mpeza or, or whatever the transfer mechanism. The third one is the dynamics that starts unleashing in the politics of getting support by uh, increasing cash transfers instead of doing what governments uh, ought to do around market failures and, and public goods again. Okay. Um, maybe I wasn't reading the uh, Foreign Affairs article carefully enough. That's what I'm kind of keying off of. But it was a bit unclear to me what its intended scope was, whether it was intending to influence the, I don't know, $30 billion a year in overseas private charity or the 130 of ODA or the, I don't know what it is, nine trillion or something like that in global social spending. These are obviously very different size pies. Um, and the conversation is kind of different at each level. My sense is it's, it's kind of towards a narrow side that's mostly going after uh, what you might call retail philanthropy, small donor philanthropy. Uh, and that's fine, but, but I think there there's, could be some value in uh, you know, clarifying what's the scope of, of the revolution that you pr foresee here. Um, uh, I like, really like the metaphor of the index fund. And as it happens, you know, I was actually an, I'm an evangelist for index fund investing myself and evangelized here when Chris Blattman was here, so I've talked to him about these things. Um, and I think the, the analogy is correct in the sense of there being low overhead. But logically, it's not correct beyond that. Uh, and that's because you know, the, the index fund idea comes out of the you have a market in which there are lots of players trading assets, trying to anticipate future movements of prices in response to new information. The index is guaranteed essentially to be the average of all that stuff. But there's no guarantee whatsoever that giving cash is the average of all possible investments in development. It could be great in some contexts, it could be average in others, it could be terrible in still others. And so for that reason, it's not actually logical, I think, to call it a benchmark. Um, the benchmark, and if you're considering a new intervention, which itself implies that we're the um, we're philosopher kings, you know, making decisions based on evidence, which isn't really how we got to one billion people receiving cash. Well, there was some role for evidence in that, but um, but if if we're positing that, the benchmark should be the best available alternative based on some mix of available evidence relevant theory, and then intelligent extrapolations from other contexts where the research was done to the present context. So the actual benchmark, logically, could be very different from place to place, time to time, depending on your goal. Um, but so I think we should just keep in mind that there, a, a given philanthropist, small or large, has all sorts of possible investments to consider. Um, and it's not obvious that it'll be hard for them to do better than giving directly. I'm thinking of the Gates Foundation. I mean, if you take these arguments to their full length, they're saying that Bill Gates should shut down his foundation, a thousand people, and just give all the money to give directly or, or its imitators as M-Pesa expands uh, and becomes more possible to re reach lots of people that way. I think that would be a pretty hard argument to sustain given that the foundation very arguably has uh, saved millions of lives. So I, 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 we just need to be um, careful. And I think there's also, a bit of a logical trap to say, well, 
we know that giving cash in this context helps these people this much. Can you do better? It's a logical trap twice over because there may be alternatives that aren't as directly targeted at individual human beings like eradicating po polio. And there may be alternatives that cannot ever meet the same burden of evidence because they cannot be submitted to randomized trials and I don't think we should take them off the table just for that. I want to pick up a little bit of uh, uh, Bill's argument regarding uh, uh, the evaluation of this, uh, this program. And the thing, if we define a benchmark, we define what is the benchmark. It is a one shot. It is a cost and flow of money. Um, um, uh, in order to be able to compare programs and use a cash transfer program as a benchmark, we need to define those, those, those metrics. And, uh, and how do we evaluate uh, those metrics along the time? Mm. Uh, along the time? Um, uh, for example, um, it is true the conditional cash transfer evidence of uh, bias on the labor market, at least in the short term, is very scant. But five, six years after and seven years after, now they are emerging some evaluation. They show some important Im impact on reducing labor supply. So can we use uh, a program as a benchmark when actually the results of the evaluation, give me an answer, will come six, seven years maybe after or 10 years after. I think it's, a, it's a, an important issue to address if we want to uh, sell this as a benchmark. Jenny, do you want to start this time? Sure. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, respond to kind of, I think, Bill's point. Bill, I wasn't necessarily clear if you were talking about kind of any aid or if you were just focusing on cash. And then maybe a little bit more broadly, you know, if we're thinking about cash, Let's be clear, we're not talking about like throwing bucketfuls of cash to people, anyone willy nilly. We're still talking about this idea of kind of social protection programs where you try and target extremely vulnerable people with some type of resource. So I'm using that as a framing because I'd like to maybe kind of bring it back uh, to three types of things. So first of all, in terms of scale, I think scale is an issue for all of these types of programs. And when we're often evaluating them, we're looking at very much at a partial equilibrium rather than a general equilibrium. You brought up the labor supply issue. I would be concerned about that, but I would actually be more concerned maybe about price and inflation, um, you know, whether or not these huge cash transfers are actually increasing prices, which then gives you, kind of mitigates the impact of your cash transfer if you're poor, but really hurts you if you are a non-beneficiary. Although some of the work that we've done in Niger, where there was a huge injection of cash transfers into a kind of small area, found that it didn't necessarily increase prices in the short term or the longer term. Markets were fairly well integrated. This is a, a very poor country with very limited roads. And recent work that was done in Mexico comparing food versus cash transfers found that while the food transfers actually kind of decreased prices, the impact of cash transfers on prices was negligible. So it really didn't seem to kind of lead to higher inflation, which is what we might be really concerned about. Second, in terms of kind of the politics, it, again, it's not clear to me why cash would be so different from any other type of kind of aid program or transfer program. And so you could make an argument kind of one of two ways. There's always the story that's going around in Afghanistan once, you know, actually MPISA was introduced, that corruption went down quite significantly because now civil servants were being paid via M-Pesa or via mobile money as compared with the traditional means, and they all thought that they had gotten a raise. I could be completely mischaracterizing this, but this is the way that the story has been told to me because it kind of bypassed the traditional way in which these salaries were actually implemented. And there was kind of an RCT that was done where a small firm was providing its salary payments to its employees and found that it reduced theft and corruption by about 50%. Now, you could also make the argument on the other side that, you know, maybe potentially mobile money, if you're working with illiterate populations, they don't know how much they're supposed to get. They can't manipulate the PIN numbers. So if you go to a local cash-in, cash-out agent, he or she might be able to steal the money from you a little bit more easily. I could see it going either way, but I think at its heart, it's really going to be some type of empirical question. And now with the advent of these new technologies, how these technologies work with um, local populations. So those are my two points. Other thing with age, uh, focus drops after an hour. Uh -oh. uh, so I didn't understand a thing these guys were saying. Uh, okay, so apparently Bill said that poor people are lazy, and if you give them money, these poor lazy people will work less. 
It's, of course, a very old argument, right? I mean, we've had this argument in the U.S. for a very long time that when you give unemployment insurance, there's a labor supply impacts, right? The whole point was the recent slew of papers on this showing that when you give, there are two things going on. Cash gives you liquidity, right? And cash might have a moral hazard in, uh, problem. Now, now, the issue was how do you separate these things out? Because what happens when you get liquidity is you're able to search more for the right match for your job, right? So if it's increasing your search capabilities and you're therefore able to find a better job, uh, then actually it is better for you to remain out of employment for a longer time, right? So Raj Chetty had this really, really nice paper in the Journal of Political Economy looking at whether unemployment insurance essentially acted as liquidity allowing you to search more and whether it had any moral hazard impacts. And the essential conclusion is it has no moral hazard impacts. It has huge liquidity impacts that allow people to search for a better job. Right? So I think this idea that, you know, so that's one piece of it. The second piece of it was there was this really nice study a long time back, uh, my memory is also going, which looked at children who were exceedingly intelligent in school, and apparently in the U.S. they have this kind of magnet schools and all this kind of stuff, which I, 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 I'm trying to figure out about. But they studied them in adulthood, and they were all working less. So like, what the hell is wrong with that, right? What's up with that? So I went and asked them, and they're like, well, you know what? Uh, I don't need to work that hard because <laughs> I'm fairly smart. Uh, <laughs> and they were really, really happy. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure that I'm very deeply <laughs> against poor people who are working 18 hours a day now working 16 hours a day, and saying that that's a terrible thing to do. You know, these guys are now so lazy, right? So I, I, I just didn't get that argument. Then David came, and I, I didn't get a thing he said. So apparently he said something. I, th I think it was trying to be snide, something about retail philanthropy, uh, and I think that's that's an interesting point because you want to ask. How can small money leverage big things, right? So when Bill Gates came into secondary schooling in the US, this is exactly the point he said. He said, look, the Gates Foundation money relative to what's being spent on education is tiny. We have to leverage it. And what I'm amazed by with Give Directly is how they have leveraged that small contribution to generate this huge conversation, right? So I think the, the, the reason you want to focus on retail philanthropy is precisely because they are small enough Right? Trying to move the World Bank is like trying to steer course on the Titanic, right? I mean, it, it's going to take a while. Uh, a while. Running out of time. <laughs> hey, don't diss the World Bank. You know, we give tons of cash transfers, right? <laughs> so, 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 uh, uh, but, so I think retail philanthropy has this idea of being flexible and, you know, if to the point that it can be leveraged, the, 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 the leverage on this can be fairly, fairly large, right? Then David said something about evaluating these according to your goal. That's exactly right, right? I mean, given the massive income and racial diversity in this room, it is going to be your goal, right? That, that's going to be evaluated, right? And you ended up with saying something about polio. I hope you had mentioned polio because that's like the best example ever of the worst <laughs> program ever, right? Uh, we have been trying to do polio eradication for 10 years now. It's apparently now been eradicated in India. Uh, Approximately 2 million children die of diarrhea, children die of measles. What do we do? We spend millions and millions, billions of rupees on eradicating two cases of polio, right? Why is it that we want to eradicate polio? The reason we want to eradicate polio is if WHO can say that polio has been eradicated, rich Americans don't need to vaccinate their kids against polio. That's the only reason, right? And the debate in India has been intense saying we are spending all these billions of rupees on two children when we have two million kids die because white people here are saying we, need, we don't want to vaccinate our kids. That's precisely the problem with these kinds of market failures being the refuge of scoundrels, right? I mean, we do not see through the pieces of these arguments and we land up in situations that have been enormously detrimental for poor people around the world. Ooh, okay. I don't know. Do I? Do I? Do I need to actually say anything? I, I don't know. I mean, it's I like, need to pony up some defensive polio eradication on the right I, side here. But go ahead. I, well, Ooh. I've got a rebuttal on that and, one. Will you wait? You wait your turn. Okay. okay well, ahead. I mean, anything I'm going to say now is going to be fairly boring and uninteresting. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yes. Oh dear. Okay. 
a couple of things here um, on the lumpy transfers. This is an interesting point, right? Uh, the give directly folks, it's really all about the lumpy transfer, which creates this quantum leap, right? It gets people out of this trap. Whereas what I'm talking about, what I've been working on are these social protection systems, small, predictable transfers. But as it turns out, there was one country in Ghana, the LEAP program, um, where the Ministry of Social Welfare couldn't get its act together. And it couldn't provide the, lumpy, the, the, the predictable transfers every two months. Uh, and so what happened is during our evaluation, they actually provided like three transfers of six months worth of cash, right? Just an accident. Guess what the impacts were in that program? Let's think about it for a minute. We were pretty excited. It was kind of a natural, natural experiment. Um, we immediately looked for goats and chickens and all that stuff, right? We found nothing, none of, no impacts on that. There was increased gift giving by these ultra poor households. And there was debt payoff. They, on the qualitative work, we asked what was going on. They said, we are re-engaging. We are able to re-engage with the informal safety nets that we were f excluded from. They invite us to the funerals. We can p pay the, the burial fees. We can be integrated back into society. Just, just think about that concept and think about what that means to poor households in these rural areas. That suddenly, with this cash, they are part of the community again. What value can we ever put on that, right? That's, ulti that's incredibly amazing. And the only reason we caught that was just because of this luck where we had these transfers that were done in this way because there was a little fight between social welfare and finance. Um, a few other things. Remember on the benchmarking, right? Conditional cash transfers don't count, right? That's not what we're talking about. Okay, because that's really back to food. That's saying, well, I believe that this is important, so I'm going to give you this, but you have to do that. The benchmarking is against an unconditional cash transfer. That's important because the Latin American evidence doesn't really help us on the benchmarking, right? Because they were conditional, and the impacts were focused on those areas where you were looking because you were conditioning the programs. Now, in Africa, it's much more exciting. Everything is unconditional, and that's why the Zambia thing is so exciting, and that's why I think that's where we look for the benchmarking case to be made. Because that's where you see, when you give the cash, what do people actually value? And what do we see across these six or seven countries? Non-farm entrepreneurship, right? Moving out of casual work and working back on their farm or off the farm. Livelihood diversification. No, we don't see big immediate impacts on child health and checkups and, and all that stuff. That's going to come later. Right now, people are trying to survive. When we go in and we condition, similarly, which is the same as providing alternative, you know, <clears throat> deciding that it's livestock or de deciding that, you know, what we think is important, we give them. That's really powerful to see what they are doing with the cash. That's why I think we should look to Africa to, to, to make the case for benchmarking. And it's very powerful. Uh, we never find evidence on prices and inflation. The supply responses are, are fairly surprising to me, but they're fairly good. Um, and on the political side, now this is really interesting, right? Um, the UNICEF strategy in Africa has been to work with members of parliament and basically explain to them the power of a cash transfer in their constituency. Now, Bill may say well, you're bribing and this is that and you're harnessing the thing. And we're saying, hey, we are empowering citizens. That's what we're doing, right? to advocate for their rights, to make sure that they get benefits that they want, that help them. And that has been a strategy. And in the Kenya program, um, which I think Paul had, had, had mentioned on his slide, that was a conscientious strategy during an election to make OVCs, or Office of uh, election strategy, a part of the election debate, and to say cash transfers for families harboring o OVC did your MP sign the pledge that he or she was going to support that when she got elected? That was part of the thing. So the political process is helping because it allows individuals, it brings an individual, allows them to advocate. Paul, any ideas? 
So I, I did want to answer David's questions, which are kind of pointed right at me, but I also kind of want to let the debate over polio rage on. Um, <laughs> so maybe can we come back? Can we come back to me? Okay. Well, can we hear from Bill? Yeah. I was just going to say people have been very patient through all this. Do, do you want to enter that, or should you we open? Do your up? last round. We'll have Paul, and then we'll go to the audience. Okay, I'll, I'll be quick. I, I, I want to um, say that I think your last point about the way people were inserted in society was fast, fascinating. And I remember hearing John Gatongo speak. I thought he was giving a keynote. I thought he'd talk about corruption. And his entire speech was about development is about people having dignity. And I, I was just really blown away by that. And I think that that's probably the strongest argument. You know, it, it, It's at the roots of a lot of the stuff of let people show what they care about and, and at least and let that into the debate. debate. Um, but I do note that Jishnu did not address my point, which was not the weak argument about labor supply, but the stronger argument about distorting the activities that people actually do engage in to get income, to get money. That was the, the corruption argument, that people will find ways to get money uh, if there's money coming in through these channels instead of through normal market processes. But that aside, um, the polio discussion is, is bizarre for you to bring up bec or to try to tackle. I think if you'd stopped right before there, I would have said, oh, I'm convinced, I'll, I'll vote. Um, but the, 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 uh, if we had been debating this in the 1960s around smallpox, you would have said the same thing, that uh, there are only a few cases in you know, different parts of the world, and uh, why should uh, the poor countries be trying to eradicate smallpox when it's really a benefit to the rich people not having to vaccinate? But that's exactly an example of a global public good where everybody benefits. And to the extent polio gets eradicated, the rest of the world isn't going to have to put money in either. So uh, to me, that's like the exact wrong example for you to sort of try to tackle David on. Might have been a good, you know, sort of push us into the defensive court. But um, smallpox is like the biggest example of people eradicating a disease, not having to have any kind of expenses on vaccination and campaigns or anything like that. Polio has been hard to eradicate, but that shouldn't be a, a burden that India should be bearing by itself. It's something that is being borne by the funding and all that stuff internationally. I would just add a little bit to that. Very well said. Um, I'm not a, a public health expert, a global public health expert, so I can't comment on the specifics of the polio campaigns. But it's an illustration of the principle, as Bill said, that one thing that public and private philanthropy and that the uh, government social spending more generally can do is contribute to global public good. So it illustrates that idea, and I don't think it's, you know, it's not credible to say there's no role for government to do that, even in the poorest countries. Um, so then just, which then raises these tough questions about how far do you want to go with this idea. And I just want to give one other example of that, which is uh, that Give Directly is riding on the rails of M-Pesa, which is primarily a... Uh, private sector initiative, although the private sector initiative is in many ways kind of emerging and is already owned by the government, and was spurred on by a challenge grant from uh, Bridget in the Polio Relief Fund. And one of the things that Bill Gates is now doing with his money is trying to uh, propagate that model around the world so that everybody, every country, and every person has access to this same infrastructure, which would then allow Give Directly to operate on a much larger scale. Um, so clearly we need that kind of philanthropy as well not just giving cash. My last point, actually, would like to get an answer on my previous point. Uh, um, if you want to implement a benchmark, you need to define exactly what you are looking for. What's the metric of success? I heard a human capital accumulation. I've seen uh, um, Ashu has spoken about income generation activities, etc., and also define uh, um, a metrics uh, and the time where you're going to measure those results to convince the constituency is better cash towards any other intervention. And that, I think, is the base of a strong argument. Um, and I haven't seen this argument. My suggestion would be uh, to narrow the scope of comparison and maybe look at uh, uh, distributive programs. And we know it's a mess all over the world in terms of the multiplication of, of different interventions try, try to distribute income. Uh, cash in kind of all sorts um, and define uh, exactly what we are looking for within two years, within three years, our impact on poverty gaps, our impact on income generation activity, our impact on human capital uh, 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 indicators. Uh, that, I think, will help building a convincing argument to use cash. And we need to define whether it's a stream of unconditional cash or a one-time uh, big injection 
towards other intervention. Otherwise, I don't think no constituency in any, in any Congress and no, no donors would buy your argument without the clear metrics of uh, definition of this, this benchmark. Yeah, so I'll take that one first. And I, I regret that we took a while to get to it, uh, Fernandino. I would say anything. I would start with anything, literally any cash transfer. And you're absolutely right that if you are in this business for social protection and say you want to minimize malnutrition, there will be a specific kind of cash transfer engineered that will be optimal for that outcome. You're right. So ideally, we would be benchmarking your nutrition intervention against that. If you know you want to move away from Dish News World, where we sort of take poor people's preferences as the gold standard and define more narrow policy objectives, right? But as a starting point, you know, even if you want to take the most naive cash transfer, the simple lump sum, I would say do it, because it will be better than what we're benchmarking against right now, which is nothing. But I think there is a lot of learning and a lot of work to be done to understand, you know, what is the optimal cash transfer for maternal health, let's say, or for nutrition, or any of these policy objectives that, for whatever reason, we tend to focus on, right? Um, that's how I think about that. David, maybe I could take the opportunity to come back to your question. So I think uh, you're absolutely right. The index fund analogy is an imperfect analogy. I think the, the part of it that I think is very important is that you have a sector in which active management soaks up a lot of money and doesn't feel any pressure to justify it. That is the part of the analogy that I, that I care about. Right? And that is the part that I think is totally relevant. And you know, you know, along those lines, I think the scope of the argument is, you know, it's frankly universal. right? Because the argument is not that the Gates Foundation should shut down but that it would be valuable for them to articulate you know, the nature of the public goods that they're creating, the evidence that the returns on those is greater than you know, the cost of providing them. And I think that's true for the Gates Foundation. And I think it's true for the government of India, as Jishnu has said, you know, they provide a lot of private goods. So um, I think because the, the, the argument is not to eliminate these things, but to justify them more rigorously, I think it really applies just about everywhere. More? Okay, I think we're ready to go to the audience now. Please introduce yourselves and then ask your question or comment. This on? Yes. I'm Diana Olbaum with the Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. And um, at the risk of sounding scoundrelly, um, I, I would like to ask some of the questions that I think the scoundrels of the opponents, I didn't hear them say. And, and I say this as someone who, who's very impressed by the whole notion of using uh, cash transfers as a, as a benchmark. But I, I think there are a few issues that we, that we need to think about. The first is that um, although most of us think that Im improving the lives of the poorest and uh, meeting the MDGs and following the SDGs are you know, a key goal of development, that's not all development is about. It's not just about improving the lives of the poorest. Otherwise, you know, you could be just talking about redistributing existing wealth and not growing the entire economy. Um, the second is that one of the biggest obstacles to development um, is bad governance. And I wonder whether um, this addresses in any way the underlying problems that, that lead to bad governance that keeps uh, countries in the situation that they're in. Um, the third is kind of a, a danger of the microfinance trap, where uh, one particular type of intervention becomes seen as you know, the, the, the fix-all. And if you only do that, everything's going to get done. And so from now on, we should only do cash transfers, because that's the the best way of working, instead of just seeing it as a, as a benchmark or a baseline. Um, I think I'd like to hear an answer to whether this type of um, cash transfer program is really an appropriate model for donors, and, and particularly for, for the United States, foreign aid, which is what I'm most concerned with, or whether this is really the kind of program that governments themselves ought to be implementing. Uh, we, ha you know, I think we have a real political problem here. With um, it's hard enough to get money for um, for welfare programs here in the United States, and trying to make a case for giving cash to foreign citizens is very difficult. So um, maybe the best use of foreign assistance dollars is to fix the the the, the market failures, the public goods that aren't going to be rectified with with cash transfers. Okay. Okay. That's a lot of questions. Okay, next, we'll, we'll gather three. Okay, 
Uh, thank you very much. This was a wonderful debate. Um, my name is Ugo Gentilini. I'm uh, with the World Bank, and I was before with the World Food Program, to be engaged in some of the evaluations that uh, Jenny mentioned earlier. Um, perhaps it's a, I, I like to challenge a bit more, uh, perhaps the panel. Um, I think a central point that is emerging is the respect, the judgment of the poor. Um, people know best. Uh, that's uh, um, Providing them choice through cash transfers, therefore, is um, an, unde an undeniable advantage of cash transfers. Um, I think Paul said that uh, cash transfers are redefinitional. Mm -hmm. So people reveal their preferences and what they care for um, by looking at what they spend cash for. So, um, but I wonder if we could adopt an, an enlarged definition of what choice is. So, so far it has been defined in terms of what people spend the cash for. But I wonder whether the real choice is also to choose what to get in the first place. So whether that is cash or whether that is in kind. Because if we look at uh, studies after studies on what people prefer in low-income countries, that may not necessarily always be cash transfers. And their preferences may vary by season. So looking especially when there are marked price dynamics. They vary by gender. So women may have different preferences from men. And they, um, they vary by location, how far they live from the nearest market where they can use the cash. So in the case of Congo that was mentioned, there was no market. They had to bring markets in through fairs. Um, so I think my bottom line is if people know best, they should be empowered by getting what they prefer. And this is quite context specific and may or may not be cash transfers. OK, that's a hard one. Uh, in the back, Nancy, and then we'll let the panelists and Paul answer. So I want to go back to Tanzania, which Bill mentioned in the beginning, where we are working to get more thinking onto the agenda there about how to deal with the cash, with the oil, wind, the actually natural gas windfall. And I was thinking throughout this discussion, and it's brought together nicely by the previous two questions, that. Um, in Tanzania, when people were asked in a mobile phone survey, ironically, about, well, what, what would you think about just, um, using this money for, ca for transfers to vulnerable households or for basically public goods, for the government to control it? Mostly they want the government to control it, and that goes back to the issue of public goods. So the question is really inappropriate because it doesn't quite address the question of what outsiders should do, but it goes back to this question of, big development and what donors should do. The elephant in the room for me is that throughout the developing world, there are not local revenue sources. That central governments really make it very difficult. They prohibit or they capture all of the revenue authority. Even when they do so-called decentralization, it's not about allowing local governments any revenue raising authority. So if we're just talking not about the outsider's money, donors, philanthropists, big ones, but about outsider's influence, the question to me is for maybe Paul and those of you who are thinking in terms of give directly, why isn't there more discussion in the World Bank, in UNICEF? I mean, it was very interesting what we heard about what UNICEF is doing about addressing the governance problems that are rooted in the lack of people's ability to empower themselves in their own communities to do collective goods by receiving cash transfers, perhaps, that are universal, and then having them taxed back at the local level. That, to me, is what is completely missing. And the, the donor community continues, say, the IMF and the World Bank, to assume that it's OK not to talk about that. That basically, m most of what the IMF does on tax policy is, is fomenting indirect taxes, the value-added tax, which is a tax in which people don't know, barely know they're paying it. The poor pay quite a lot because they consume most of their income, et cetera. So I, I'm, this, a little bit an unreasonable question in this context, but 
it does go to the heart of these two earlier questions about big development, dealing with the governance issue, and also addressing the preferences of people who, who even in Tanzania, they want what they think government should provide in terms of collective goods. OK, hard questions. So Paul, do you want to answer first? And I, I wonder if I'm going to get you a, a microphone, but you can start now. Yeah, sure. And I guess uh, we have a, a long list now between the group, but maybe um, I'll speak to Nancy's last just because it's something that I've been thinking, we've been thinking a lot about and excited to understand more. I think there is certainly this sort of, I have this argument with Jishnu that, you know, I think one of the exciting things about um, these new technologies is the potential to sort of localize resources much more. Um, and uh, and Jishnu asked me, what about legitimacy and what about the rights of sovereign states and so forth? And so we That's have, what I was so we have these, we, <laughs> these, good, these good debates. But I mean, one of the things, you know, we've done this first round of impact evaluation at Give Directly, and the thing that we're working on right now is a, is a larger scale thing where the unit of observation is the village and one of the main things that we're interested in is sort of local public finance. Um, the informal taxation, folks who provide labor to volunteer projects, uh, the management of local school committees, things like this. We know anecdotally a little bit about um, how local public finance reacts to a large influx of purchasing power but not too much. And so I think it's an interesting open hypothesis that sort of those local institutions um, are able to take advantage of some of that and provide some of those more local public goods. Um, we know of very simple examples of a few communities that have paved roads, of people who have pooled together to sort of import goods in bulk, basic things like that. Um, but I think there's a lot more to be learned. So I'm super excited about that, but I don't think we know too much yet. Jishnu can yell at me if you want. Yes. I'd rather hear from the defenders in response to the questions, but I do have one thought. Okay. What about big development? <laughs> This, so this do Nancy, by, I have a, a, a um, somewhat contrarian position on state capacity and governance, right? Which is, um, I have a somewhat contrarian position on state capacity and governance. So it's not, it, it may be contrarian to what, what goes on in D.C. Uh, it, it's uh, inspired by my father-in-law, I guess. Uh, so he was reading this book on India, right? Ram Guha's book on India after Gandhi. And he said, you guys are crazy. I said, why, why, why are we crazy? He said, look, in 50, it took Spain, comes together as a uh, republic almost in its current boundaries around 1500. He said, it took us 480 years to get to some sort of stability. What you guys have managed to do in 50 years is crazy, right? So, you know, part of an issue that I really have is, look, a lot of our countries are 60 years old, right? Give it 300 years. Let's see where it goes, <laughs> right? So I don't understand why we are in this rush. And the problem with this rush is fairly serious, right? Uh, so the, the, the way that argument gets constructed is it's poor governance. Therefore, we should come in from outside and improve governance. And governance is actually capacity, and we should improve capacity. So Nick Vanderwall has this great book called The Permanent Crisis in Africa. And one of the fundamental points he makes is that state capacity is endogenous, right? I mean, so, so you know, uh, no, no, so, so Kapuzinski's point on, on, on uh, Ethiopia, right? I mean, there can only be one son, right? If people have two sons, where do they know where to look, right? So, so the whole point is, you know, the state capacity being endogenous means that the political system will ensure that there's lower state capacity so that they, they, they can, you know, there's only one son, right? Now, how did that get resolved? The argument has been that that only got resolved as states had to give uh, claim legitimacy for their taxation by provision of social services. So this is Daniel Berger's work in Nigeria, right? I mean, looking at the north and the, the, the area where taxation happened and where it didn't. And I think that is exactly, so this is what Angus Deaton's been arguing, that's exactly what's disrupted when people come from outside and try and meddle in the governance of a place, saying, oh, why hasn't it improved in the last year, right? Uh, you know, we'll soon go to bi-weekly, uh, you know, fortnightly targets for governance. I mean, this is insane, right? So, so, so I really think, you know, I, I think there's a fundamental danger there with the timing that donors and the shelf life of donors and these things and what's happened in European and American countries and how long it took them to get anywhere on this, right? I mean, Tammany Hall, I mean, look, it, it was like that for the longest time. So 
I think we have to be careful about that. And I think the main lesson that we have learned at the bank is primarily that, look, actually having dedicated non-political flows of resources is probably the best thing we can do. So imagine now we have this cash transfer which says, regardless of your political process, people are going to get this money and you have no control over it. Right? I feel that's actually a far better policy for governance because politicians know it cannot be manipulated and people know that it's unrelated to the political process. And I think that has the least corrupting influence of aid possible among a lot of things that I, that I see in Africa. I hope somebody will also answer the question about the U.S. government and cash transfers. Go ahead, Ferdinando. Make sure I was getting that point, um, which is linked to governance. Um, if you look at the experience with cash transfer in Latin America, large scale, actually I would, uh, I would uh, argue there have been a great vehicle to strengthen governance. And uh, for example, in terms of accountability of the sector to provide quality services. In terms, for example, of targeting, so I'm arguing on the other side, <laughs> targeting uh, 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 usually non-subsidized uh, um, uh, other form of redistributive uh, tools. It's through the cash transfer, the empowerment, the community level that Asha was, uh, was, uh, was describing before, you finally discover that actually the services that are supposed to be there are not there. What more powerful governance tools you have than that? So. Um, Arguing that having, having financed cash transfer for 15 years, I'm more on that side. And uh, I think they have a very powerful uh, uh, hook on uh, many governance issues from uh, uh, transparency of the use of funds, targeting of the use of funds, uh, uh, community involvement, and, uh, and accountability of services towards the, the, the users. Bill? Um, I just want to respond to a few of the, the comments there. Um, one about uh, no markets in the Congo, I think, is an interesting one because the using cash as a benchmark, it's sort of like, you know, is this, here's this project, we divide it by the number of people in that area, it comes out to $300 per household. Is that going to, I mean, the thought experiment Paul and as are asking us to do is, is to confront and say, is this thing going to generate at least $300 of benefit for these people? Now, that's actually a lower standard than we had to do at the IDB where we were supposed to get a 12% rate of return out of everything. But then we only applied that standard to a small percentage of the projects where we could quantify benefits, and then we didn't even verify at the end of the project whether it got that return. So um, I think it's a really powerful um, uh, you know, sort of c confrontation of the active managers, as Paul put it. Um, and you have to do that qualifying. There are conditions where even handing somebody $300 isn't worth a penny because it just, there isn't anything to buy there. Um, but that's sort of more saying, is this really broadly relevant benchmark, or is it only 90% valid, or is it only 20% valid, depending on the context? Um, whether this is going to be a fad like microfinance, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me the world is so full of so many different fads right now, it would be hard to take that space. Um, and uh, it would be, I don't know, it, I'll just leave that one aside. But the, the last point was about the US support for these things. And that's where um, I think it's intriguing to look at how conditional cash transfers are and analyzed. Lant Pritchett makes a point that his, ar his argument is that the reason Mexico did the conditional cash transfers wasn't actually because they were trying to get uh, poor people more education. It was that it was a political uh, tool to get support for what was a, a, a cash transfer uh, redistributive program. And that. I just don't know how to, how to, as it were, endogenize it. In other words, how, what's the elasticity of, of getting money out of the U.S. relative to the tool of what you use to market it? And But I think one of the things that may be changing is that this just changes the conversation. If you start saying this is a way to get $300 in cash to people uh, compared to you know, some other way, that might actually be more powerful, but I think it takes a politician with, a, with the right message. Jenny. No, I wanted to ask my own question, but go ahead. I, it's not but about I, me. No, so I just want to add maybe two more Paul. things. I hope I'm not repeating. Um, so talking about, I, I do think that from a political perspective, this is sensitive, right? And we talked about, you know, if you're a non-beneficiary, you see someone else getting cash, and how does that make you feel? I mean, this assumes that you don't get any utility from other people, you know, benefiting from potentially 
your tax contribution. I think for the U.S. government, though, I mean, we have seen, even though it's primarily in kind for U.S. foreign assistance, there has been a growth in the past few years from going to cash transfers as compared to the in-kind transfers. And if you're just focusing on the Title II program, it's been very clear, at least for the past 10 or 15 years, that there has been kind of a movement towards cash, perhaps not cash transfers, but this whole idea of monetization, right? So then rather than distributing food, I'm going to give it to an NGO, which they sell in a local market, and then they can use that cash to do whatever they want to. And so, I, you know, the question is, you know, if people knew that you were getting cash as compared to something else, how would that make them feel? And then maybe it gets back to this kind of marketing issue. Do you need to kind of define metrics that are acceptable metrics that make me feel okay because I've shared my tax dollars and it's kind of given me this type of outcome? Or if I knew that the cash was giving me a greater bang for my buck as compared with something else, would that make me feel okay about it as well? I'm not sure what the answer to that is. And then I just want to come back to maybe Nancy's point about I refer to this myself. So, you know, when we ask people, it's really hard to know, you know, what type of answers we're getting when we ask people what they want, right? So if you ask me what I want, I'm going to give you an answer depending upon who you are and what program I'm in. And that's the case regardless of where you are. And, you know, what they found through all these IFPRI and WFP studies is that people often say that they want the program that they are currently participating in. Now, whether that's because they really like that program or they don't necessarily know what the alternative is. And, and that is the thing that I really do like about cash and where I think you can find these very surprising results is that you really see what people value. And why I think that's important is because some of Chris Blattman's work has shown that when they get this huge transfer, they're actually investing in skills that have kind of a public goods quality in terms of education. Or, you know, Paul mentioned this kind of small example of looking at these villages. We also saw a case in Niger where two villages had an influx of cash and they built an irrigation canal between the two of them, all by themselves, which I thought, that's amazing. Now, could you kind of expand that up across all of the villages in Niger? I'm not really sure, but I think that that's kind of the beauty of some of this cash is you can really observe what people value. And I'm often surprised and kind of very heartened and encouraged by what people value. And then the question is, how could you take that and kind of potentially combine it with something else to yield a kind of better development outcome? I don't know. But. Paul, and then we'll go back to the audience. Oh, she's the boss. We have to give her a second <laughs> round. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is later. it a two-hander? No, 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 she said later. Oh, later. Okay, good. Paul, and then we'll go back to the audience. Oh, we can go right there. I was just going to okay. add to Bill's another example of this, because I think this is you know, exactly right that the, uh, these things have very different political valence in different contexts and depending on who's in power. And so it's, uh, it's funny to talk to Diffit about cash transfers, right? Because they did a lot of them when labor was in power, and it was all about empowerment and social protection. Um, and they still do a lot of them now that the Tories are in power, but now it's about value for money. <laughs> Yay. See? So you don't have to be a neoliberal to like cash transfers. OK, second row. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Yeah, Brendan Horton. Um, I used to be at the bank. I think that uh, there seem to be the young, the getting old, and the truly aged, okay, of which I'm a member. I want to try and associate some things that were said this morning. Um, and I think what I have to say sort of really buttresses what Nancy was saying just now. I think what I, what I heard somebody say was that there's a basic problem with bad governance. What Jenny seemed to say was that private transfers have the possibility of generating positive externalities. What Jishnu said was that actually every government does cash transfers because it distributes wages to the selected few who work for the public service. It trusts those people. But then the, other, the rest of the time, it spends money generally on inefficient provision of public goods. It seems to me somehow that the central question that has to be addressed is whether or not private transfers will enable alternative mechanisms for the more efficient provision of public goods at the local level. That's a very important and a very difficult question. But it means that it seems the role of private philanthropy to me seems to hold the possibility of doing that, providing 
that outsiders get politically accepted in the countries to which the resources are being transferred. And that's a fundamentally political question which is very, very hard to answer. I'm not sure that institutions like the bank or IDB can do it, but I think the challenge is to see whether or not private philanthropy can be more effective in that regard. And finally, what that seems to me to do is to challenge us to call into question as to what is what should be our priority in terms of political development. A unitary state? Or a decentralized state? Or a state or a country in which there's a central government and then coexisting with that, there is the provision or the construction, natural kind of construction of local, local communities, local associations, which try to have a go at the provision of these c collective services, which are indeed essential to uh, development. Okay, thank you. Um, Richard, in the middle here, and then the person next to him. Thank you. I'm Richard from Wellspring Advisors. Um, two quick comments or questions. One, I wanted to, Jishnu, I wanted to challenge you on one thing. You take very seriously this, this idea of, of revealed preference. People know what's best. Um, therefore, by definition, cash in the absence of market failures, which we don't have to take seriously, according to you. But in the absence of market failures, clearly cash will beat everything. I want to ask you, how can you reconcile that with evidence that suggests that, for instance, the way cash transfers are labeled makes a huge difference in how they're used. So in the fact that, for instance, unconditional cash transfers that are called educational transfers result in huge investments in education, how, like, what does that say about um, the, the, this, this strong assumption I have, that is, of course, widespread in economics, that um, uh, people's choices always reveal their fundamental um, preferences and needs. Um, so I think that that's one concern at, or one question I'd like to challenge you on. Um, I think a, 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 a second comment, I'm not sure I'm going to get this across, but I think among people who think about development and the role of cash transfers in development, when, if you use impact evaluation, as, and, and the results that you get back from an impact evaluation as the kind of benchmark of success, then I'm, I sometimes wonder if cash transfers are, have sort of, you know, have a leg up, have, have sort of the easiest time. Because many, many development projects try in one form or another to quote unquote lay the foundations for development, which is challenging and it clearly often doesn't work. But if you try to take a program that aims to do this in some way by spurring entrepreneurship or something, and, and, and that program did that well, you benchmarked it against cash in the form of a short-term impact evaluation, and most impact evaluations are by, de by definition very short-term. What if in the true world cash creates this kind of sugar rush? Yes, you see productive assets increase. Yes, you see positive indicators change. We really just don't have that much long-term impact uh, data. And what if, in fact, cash transfers then comes back to sort of haunt you in the form of, say, if it was implemented by government, it would lead to more patronage, it would lead to worse governance. It could have all sorts of sort of negative repercussions. I think that's like a vague concern <laughs> that, that people have about using short-term impact evaluation as, as the kind of gold standard um, for, for benchmarking interventions against each other without sort of trying to get at the fundamentals of what it is that you're trying to accomplish and what that means, you know, 10 years down the road when we simply won't, just won't have that kind of impact data. <laughs> that wasn't really a question, I guess, yeah. but that was a concern. Great, you. excellent. What, can you pass the microphone to the person next to you? Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Juliana Lindsay with Women for Women International. Um, previously, I worked with UNICEF on the cash grants in South Africa, in Ghana, et cetera. And in, in that context, we focused very much on the benefits in terms of Ashu slide. But with Women for Women, I've seen a very different benefit that I think links to some of the government's issues that have been discussed, which is more on the social side. 
we've found in the 20 years that we've operated a cash transfer program in conflict and post-conflict situations that giving a very, very poor, marginalized woman cash has a social benefit in the sense that she suddenly has a tool that she can transfer, no pun intended, into power. If it's perhaps in her household with her husband, if he's been beating her, it gives her the financial wherewithal to walk away, which she might not otherwise have had. We see it not only in the violence area, but in many other areas. There's a social benefit in terms of her ability to interact, make decisions, have the confidence to make decisions, both within the household and also within the community. And this is where the link to governance comes in. We've seen, for example, in Bosnia, where we've been doing this for 20 years, one of the people, one of the women we worked with, actually ran for mayor successfully, <clears throat> excuse me, and is now the mayor of her village. I was in Bosnia a couple of weeks ago and heard other stories about the women coming together in associations and now convincing the municipal government to increase the amount of money that they're allocating for agricultural inputs and then successfully applying to the municipal government to receive those agricultural inputs to improve their own agricultural businesses. So it's this little insert of cash, $10 a month, is the very beginning of confidence that they gain. And I would argue that the life skills training that we provide, the financial training that we provide, if it were just that alone without the cash, the confidence that they would gain and the tool that they would have to transfer that into power, whether it's within the household or whether it's convincing leaders in their municipal government to take a particular action, that tool and that confidence would be much lower. Interesting. Um, now, there's one person okay. who's been waving for like two okay. minutes now. In the back, yeah. we'll give you. Thank you. Um, I just actually wanted to follow up on that comment. I'm Ann Warner with the International Center for Research on Women and take a slightly different perspective on, on that point, which I think is a great one. But how can cash transfers potentially rectify or potentially exacerbate inequality and particularly gender inequality, which is, you could argue, one of uh, the major market failures? Um, and if, I think the point is great that maybe without cash, the life skills education, the other inputs um, may not have been as, um, as powerful for these individual women. At the same time, cash without interventions or activities or something to address social norms that perpetuate violence against women and inequality um, and don't... Um, also enhance the educational or health opportunities, access to family planning, et cetera, may not uh, give women uh, the, the opportunities that we would wish for them to. Okay, that's a, a, a huge set of questions. Um, uh, but there, there is a very, a quite a literature now, I think, on the impact of giving cash transfers to women versus men um, and the effects that it has had on within household relations, which is interesting. Um, can I, I'm going to add one more question, uh, and that is, you know, concretely, would you want to see the World Bank uh, doing economic evaluation on projects that compares to cash, at least in social protection interventions or labor market interventions or whatever? Is that a realistic thing to ask uh, economists and TTLs to do? Like, what is the outcome you'd like to see when we talk about this index idea? Okay, Nancy. And that's it. That's really it. Like the worst moderator ever. <laughs> so I wanted to go back to the dilemma that I framed very poorly, um, which is the following. Take us out of the world where the outsiders, including those here in the room, in favor of cash transfers, live. I am actually strongly in favor of using the natural gas windfalls in countries for cash transfers. The question, and so it's not a question about what the outsiders are doing, and I may have confused everybody, including Jishnu, by mentioning the IMF. But the, the question is whether cash transfers, whether we could look at the extent to which they do make governance and endo governance is endogenous. Do cash transfers at the local level ever generate the kinds of responses that have to do with citizens demanding better governance? In that sense, are cash transfers 
possibly a substitute for effective tax systems in countries where we, those fav who favor cash transfers, want to allow people to express their own preferences, right? Not have big government and big centralized government, this is an exaggeration, conspiring with the IMF and the major big development institutions on highly centralized approaches to collecting revenue, which make it difficult to have any local governance that responds to people's own preferences. The dilemma is if you ask people in Tanzania, maybe the questions are badly posed, etc. But if we go to Tanzania and say, we want you to do cash transfers, we're expressing our preferences, then people say, well, look, we ask people what they want. And they want government to gather this money and provide them public goods. So I think Paul gave a very interesting response in saying there's new research efforts to assess whether the cash transfers generate demand for collective goods. And I guess the dilemma is that this is all a great idea from outside, ironically. <laughs> you know, we're for the people, and big government may not be for the people, but it's the outsiders who are for the people, and that's kind of where the dilemma is in generating a kind of switch within governments where they spend their own money more on cash transfers. I hope I've made myself more clear. This would be the connection that we're all looking for between the idea of cash transfers, allowing people to express their own preferences, and the generation of the collective goods, which is, at least in Tanzania, what people seem to want government to provide. Okay, so Can talk that happen, you know, and how do we from a research point of view, Take help away the out. microphone from her. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay. Um, so talk about what we know about the impact of cash transfers on governance and responsiveness of public services. What Have you found... Uh, I don't think there's been a, an enormous amount of study, but Paul's talked about some, some new work that he's doing. But thoughts on that? Okay. Yes, it's important. Uh, <laughs> I don't... You go first. Okay. I, I'll, I'll tackle uh, two couple of things there. First of all, the examples we got from women to women, is that what it's called? And, and I, women for women and ICRW, um, I mean, th it's proof by existence. In other words, there are, or, or the example you gave about the irrigation, um, yeah. I remember a, I could go through some interesting stories too from my days at the IDB where you see some kind of resource sh show up in a community and then this, you know, incredible positive things can happen. <laughs> so I think it definitely happens. And so part of what we're trying to figure out is, we also can imagine, or we know cases where resources end up being used by powerful people within local communities to, to distort and make things worse. So it's more, you know, that's sort of one of these empirical questions. When does it go one way? When does it go another way? And are there better or worse ways for the resources to come in? And that, you start asking questions like if you give them, if the cash is directly to a woman in the household, there's a whole intra-household literature and, and the importance of that. So, um, that seems to me uh, sort of it tackles this underlying question about governance that's um, it's sort of like at this it, going from the micro level, which is where we're, we're sort of talking, back to what Jishnu was saying about the 300 year process. I mean, it, it's ridiculous to think that you could have a governance program that improves governance directly. So I'm always trying to understand what it is that comes into a political process that's more likely to be helpful than worse. Um, and then the second thing I want to tackle was something that's sort of come around here several times is around preferences. And actually, even the, what you were saying about the framing of the, of the question in Tanzania. Because to me, um, when I, I have bad memory, so I, I can't quite get back to my first year of economics. But I think they said that preferences were given. And that's the basic start of all the models. You know, preferences are given. And here's the, the prices, and then people optimize their, their, their uh, welfare function based on that, pre that preference function. And everything we know about, uh, and the behavioral economics stuff has done a really good job of getting us into the economics profession, but everybody knew that outside of economics, is that preferences change. And preferences change in all kinds of bizarre ways. And even 
um, not, not just sort of individually over life cycle, but the way social uh, things are presented, the way politicians argue for things. Um, and so uh, and my favorite example is, is tobacco. People will argue that, you know, well, we shouldn't allow, you know, get rid of tobacco or make tobacco illegal because, you know, if people get some enjoyment out of it, what's the big deal? But you take the same person in a smoke-free society and, and they'll find other things to enjoy. <laughs> tobacco is not inherently some enjoyable thing. So I just want to pose that as saying that I think that the cash stuff is fascinating for revealing what people do. Um, that it's, but, but more, it seems to me, the root of all this stuff is that money in capitalist societies is power. And whether it's power in the marketplace to buy something or ability to leave an uh, abusive husband or, or something like that. And so to me, that's the whole exciting thing about the cash stuff is to, is to, to see if there's some alternate tool to break this down, and then finally, um, to just you know do that simple calculation: how many dollars per household, and really ask yourself whether the cost-benefit analysis um, justifies it. Vishnu, thoughts? Oh. My English is getting worse as well as my age. Uh, I, really? I always thought like a question was a sentence with a question mark at the end. So between the questions and my bad memory, I'm just going to address a it's couple just of free associate. Them, it's okay. Which is, okay, I think there are two really key issues that, that, that I, I want to take on, right? One is the idea that, um, that you cannot do welfare computations on revealed preference uh, when, uh, uh, when you believe that the choices don't reflect welfare, right? So any behavioral economics is going to be based on a violation usually of transitivity, okay? which is I prefer A to B, I prefer B to C. Uh, economic theory is based on the idea that A will be preferred to C, and behavioral economics says, no, I'll switch that around. Right. So it's the violation of transitivity that makes this happen. Now here's my problem with this, which is it's fine. So first, on, on the labeling issues, right? I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I wonder whether you're talking about the paper from Morocco uh, on, uh, for instance. You, you want to be careful about that paper, right? Because it's not a randomized experiment of labeling at all. That's a side thing which they interpret because of their results. And there is, of course, a large literature on advertising and what it does, right? I mean, starting with Maybe labeling what it does is give a political signal saying the government's going to uh, cares about this, right? Uh, it changes your information base. But the, the, the problem that, so here's, here's one way to think about this problem, right? Which is the idea of market failures allowed us a specific institutional response to when government should step in. Okay? The problem with saying that I will prove to you that transitivity does not work and therefore choices are not uh, salient, is that you do not have an institution or an institutionalization of that, of that failure that makes sense. Okay, let me try and say this very clearly. Virginia, okay, Virginia was debating a law at some stage which said that if you wanted to exercise your choice over abortion, you had to get an invasive ultrasound, right? I could do a randomized study. My randomized study would be the following. Uh, I will subject women who come to a clinic to either get an invasive ultrasound or not, okay? I will show you at the end that those who were subject to the in invasive ultrasound were less likely to abort, okay? Therefore, I have shown you that preferences are not stable and salience matters. Okay, salience is one big thing. The problem with this is it does not allow me an institutionalization of the limit to government action, right? And that's the fundamental issue which is which you're going to face, which is when you start taking any of these things through to say, can I construct cases, right, where the same situation will not make sense, and the answer is yes. Right? So Sendel, for example, will argue that the cases that behavioral economics argues for are cases where you ask people, are you able to meet your own stated goal? And if they say, I am not able to meet my own stated goal, that 
is a reason for government action, right? So we have to be very, very careful about what behavioral economics, which part of behavioral economics is talking about violations of, of preferences, and which part of behavioral economics is talking about policy, right? And very little of behavioral econo e economics, as the behavioral economists would argue, so far talks about policy, because there is no institutional framework within which that is based, right? Uh, let me just stop there. Ashim? Uh, I think maybe it's, at this point, given all that's been said, it's useful to just reflect a little bit on the approach by UNICEF in this area on the, in the ground, right? UNICEF has country offices in basically every developing country in the world. And over the last seven years, UNICEF has really been the main agency pushing for social protection and cash transfer in particular, and Juliana and Ferdinando, do you still admit that you work for UNICEF, or is that, have you taken that off your, your CV? <laughs> okay. Um, and the argument begins with rights, you know, and I know in, a, in Washington you don't talk about rights, right? That's bad. Um, but it does, it does start with rights. It ends with cost effectiveness and, and you know, value for money, as in DFID, and, and when you go to the Ministry of Finance, ultimately, you talk about those. But within the DFID and UNICEF you know, group, which is really the, the lead in social protection on the ground, it's about rights, and it's about empowering people who are socially excluded to be able to voice their you know, opinions, to give them the dignity, to let them somehow be able to participate both in the market and in society, right? And so here I've seen that sort of people as an afterthought have said yes, and there's also that aspect of it. And it's, it's interesting because in the other part of the world where all this is happening on the ground, that's the first part of it all. And the other part comes when you have to go to certain places and talk a particular kind of language, right? But really if you think about the wave, why, why this thing is taken off in Africa, it comes really from the rights basis of it, okay? So I thought I would say that. It doesn't answer any question here. But I, I thought, as a, since it does say UNICEF here, uh, I, sh I figured I should bring that up. Just to remind people that, those, that there are people out there who still there. believe in human rights. <laughs> do, you, do you, Paul, want to say something about these sure. kinds of issues? Uh, I, I, yeah, I can't really speak to all of them. So I'll pick one and, and be very practical, because I think a few questions have raised the issue of sort of what practically do big governments and aid organizations do, and what sort of interaction does that imply uh, with uh, the governments in developing countries. And I think that, you know, from what I've seen, there are sort of essentially two options on the table if we were to conclude in a given setting that cash transfers were the most cost-effective thing to do. And one is, you know, sort of what GiveDirectly has been doing, I guess, which is to largely bypass government and then potentially learn something along the way about how these influxes of resources affect local uh, local government and the provision of local public goods. The other is to engage directly. Um, and then I think you know the interesting governance issues that come up there um, may be best illustrated by uh, the experience in Pakistan with the Benazir Income Support Program, where um, external funders were at least initially providing a large chunk of the money. Um, and this led to real conflicts of opinion over how things should be done, right, which really highlight the issues that Nancy is raising, right, I think. Um, but in my view, ended in a good place where, you know, the initial plan for choosing participants for this program was each MP goes to their home district and comes back with a list. And if it said, no, that's not good enough, um, we're going to do something proper and we're going to use technology and have an auditable database and so forth. And that was the end result. And so, you know, clearly there was some sacrifice there of sovereignty, but I think also at the end of the day, a better outcome for the poor. And I guess making value judgments about those kinds of interactions, I feel is still a bit above my pay grade and I'll leave it to Nancy. Um, but that seems to me like a fairly uh, promising way to work together. Okay, David. Uh, this will be our last. Oh my, this won't, last be, won't be worthy. Of, oh, okay. Uh, so I was thinking about uh, Paul's argument that uh, give directly was analogous, or cash cash grants are analogous to an index fund, in the sense that it poses the challenge to other interventions of justifying their overhead, right? Um, and I, I realize that we're talking about different kinds of problems, which is probably always happens in grand dis discussions of aid and, and some development. There's what you might call micro problems, helping households make their lives a bit better. Possibly you can think about 
uh, the example of the Jenny offered of two, two communities connecting themselves by a, a irrigation channel, essentially local problems, where there's a pretty strong case that outsiders are going to have are going to have a hard time doing better than the locals themselves in solving those problems. And there, I think there are a set of uh, retail philanthropies and other aid programs and so on that are trying to do things in that space. And I think it's great that you're taking them on and saying, can you actually prove that your overhead is justified? I think it's a very strong argument and it's a tremendous contribution. Um, then there's a set of broader macro questions, whether it's eradicating diseases or you know, building roads and power plants and all this kind of stuff. You know, that are, we, we can still think, them in fairly, think of them technocratically, economically, although of course they are always inherently political. Uh, and then, then it's less obvious that this is a useful benchmark that helps us think about whether and how to engage in those kinds of problems. Um, you get there into questions about sort of you know, fundamental questions of aid about whether, whether outside agents can constructively help solve these problems or whether they are doomed because of their own bureaucratic perversities and the, the political realities that they cannot escape to just make things worse. I think if you want to suggest that this is a benchmark for that kind of problem solving, you have to go into those kinds of questions, which are tough. And then there's even huger problems which have to do with, with Nancy said, development with a big D. Can we support political development, uh, real changes in accountability and so on over, over the long run? And the funny thing about that is that you can actually argue that cash transfers work great at the micro end and at the super macro end by changing the political economy, although I'm sure people have thought about these things a lot will say there's a lot of complexities there as well. But I find that quite interesting. Okay, Paul, I think you, you're going to have the last word. Thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, do you have any last reflections uh, on the conversation we've had today? Oh, I'll, I'll just wrap. I think Go those ahead. last words were my last words. Um, thank you to all the panelists. It was fascinating. Okay, thanks to all of you, and thanks to the audience for great questions. Thank you.